Well, let's do a little toolbox talk on the upcoming 18th edition uh, coming up this July. Um, this is going to be short and sweet, and there's going to be some material missing, such as rewriting some of the sections that are going to be introduced. Uh, but I've just highlighted some of the areas that are some of the things that are coming in. Um, some some of it's stuff we already kind of knew, but a lot of people are saying, you know, how do I find information out? There's lots of information out there, but uh, I just thought I'd release this short, short toolbox talk video just to introduce some of these changes. We'll be developing more videos as we get more time to put them in, and obviously I'll be developing some training as well to go with that. Um, there will be um, an announcement soon on the training opportunities that I'm going to be introducing in partnership with Ascot College, um, which is quite exciting actually. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see when the time comes. But let's let's crack on with this because this is a talk about sort. Let's make it short and sweet. So uh, added content to 411.3.1.2 with regards to the uh, the um, inter in the installation of protective bonding. It's just added the wording um, that metallic pipes entering the building having an insulated section at their point of entry need not be connected to the protective echo potential bonding. This isn't new. This has been in the on-site guide for a while, but they've now introduced it to the 17th, uh, into the 18th, and it, it's it's crazy how how many people still get confused with the application of bonding and supplementary bonding and echo potential bonding. I'm seeing lots of debates over it, and um, may have to put some content on that really, just to kind of uh, cover it. So yeah. They've added that. This shouldn't be new. This should be an understood thing from the on-site guy. They've introduced it to the 18th edition. The next one, 411.3.2.2. This was the area in the regulations that would tell us the uh, if we were to use automatic disconnection of supply, what the requirements of um, the disconnection time requirements would be if we had final circuits up to 32 amp or distribution circuits, and if it's a TN or a TT or a system. And it's, it's the table that gave us uh, 0.4 seconds in table 41.1. For a TN system, for example, um, used to be um, that it would be applied for uh, final circuits up to 32 amp, but it still is. It says there 32 amp circuits supplying fixed equipment only. But if your actual circuit is a socket outlet circuit, they've actually increased that to a 63 amp socket outlet circuit. So if your socket, if your circuit, your final circuit goes to a socket outlet that is 63 amp, that also comes within the quicker disconnection time. Yeah, so it, it cuts off a final circuit to the 32. Unless it's a socket circuit, then it actually cuts off at 63. So it's just a little little uh, increase in the um, in the coverage there for that one. We also have, when it regards to additional protection, so the question of whether or not we need to have RCD protection. Um, it used to be for a socket outlet with a rated current not exceeding 20 amps, so 16 amp, 13 amp socket outlets typically. They've pushed that up as well to 32 amps, so more coverage, more protection. Yeah. So the previous regulation was quicker disconnection. This is obviously additional protection, more coverage for the use of socket outlets. They were going to actually say all socket outlets must have a RCD in the draft. That has been amended now. The introduction of uh, the uh, the risk assessment method to to uh, control whether or not RCD protection is needed has been reintroduced um, because obviously the introduction of a uh, 30 minute RCD protection on every single socket outlet in the circuit or mobile equipment for 32 amp outdoors it's in some scenarios it's not very practicable and so they've reintroduced the risk assessment for the socket outlet section but these risk assessments must be carried out properly uh, this is new um, in a dwelling environment, we need to have a 30 mAh CD on any lighting circuit or a circuit that has luminaires within it. Um, you could say it's due to the risk of impact protection of cables on the wall, but no, that's covered under protection against impact. This is most likely down to the um, the, the the numerous ways we're utilizing lighting, especially in the homes with the introduction of LEDs and fancy display lighting, plus the, the actual ability to go down to the local DIY store and actually buy a luminaire and then put it up yourself. So, so we're now we're now driving to have additional protection on this circuit in the home. So, should there be um, any risk or any any um, inability to effectively isolate while carrying out the installation of a light that you've gone and down the B and Q and bought, it's just that extra protection. It's the dwelling dwelling location only for that one. Now, in Chapter 42, uh, Protection Against Thermal Effects, they've um, kind of re-brought out this. Uh, it kind of disappeared before the 17th, but they've brought it back out in the 18th, the, uh, the mention of the arc fault dis uh, detection device. 
Um, do your own research on these devices because I mean they do serve a purpose. You know they 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 they, they monitor the, the the currents and they can pick up these little transients that you get when you have arcing and they can disconnect. They are a disconnecting device. Um, <clears throat> the recommendation of the regulations is to only put them in as it says they're recommended if we have a place of sleeping accommodation or if we have a place where there's a risk of fire due to the nature of process of stored materials. The similar types of locations that we would consider a a wiring system that would propagate fire really you know uh, that kind of scenario you know uh, public significance and things like that. Um, I have recently watched um, a seminar by one of the manufacturers uh, Eaton <laughs> and, they, and they were kind of suggesting that even light circuits should have these because of the risk of penetrating the light switch switch drop um it's clearly it's clearly the manufacturer's incentive to push these devices out there they are going to be very expensive while they're being launched and also these devices are supposed to be selected for each final circuit at the um, at the board so a discrimination thing we're supposed to actually have them employed for every single circuit and that's going to result in obviously um larger modules larger ways and a lot of money and the fact that they are a recommendation means they're not an instruction so it may be that if you choose to go with them that a another electrician would choose not to and then there's a huge price difference so i think that these are going to be um in, in larger commercial industrial installations these probably will be a a generic just a design pattern they you know uh, they'll be they'll be selected naturally uh, but i think in um they're not really suitable for the domestic really um whilst whilst in the us they are in the domestic world I think I think here until we're actually pushing them and they're more affordable, I think we're just going to be hearing about them and ignoring them for a period of time. Let's see, let's see what happens. Uh, the manufacturers want you to buy them, though, obviously. But um, do a little bit of research on them. This was interesting. Um, I just yeah, I just popped up and noticed it. Five one four dot twelve dot two. The uh, the illustration of the RCD test label. They've increased the frequency of testing to six monthly. So it was quarterly, it's now six monthly. Fine, that's uh, okay. But they're also adding in the wording that the sticker no longer needs to be put at the fuse board, it actually needs to be put near each single RCD within an installation. So if you have them in the board, that's fine. But if you have these RCDs on socket outlets, so if you have them in um, sub, sub DB units or, th or things like that they'll need to be that label next to those RCDs as well um, and it's not that you know the word push to test has to be there the regulation says this label and it, the label that is illustrated in the regulations it says it needs to be no smaller than the illustration and it's about that size so it's, it's quite a size so uh, I don't know apparently we're supposed to put this on adjacent to every single RCD now 52110. Um, this one, I'm, I'm kind of glad about this one because I did a, a video which I'll, meant, I'll link to up here. It's a longer video, 45 minutes odd, so don't watch it now on your on your on your toolbox talk time. But um, this was introduced to obviously protect or safeguard firefighters, etc., um, due to premature collapse of installations. It's now been taken out of the um, the the emergency escape scope, and it's now in total scope. So all electrical installations will need to have these um, these installation methods adopted. But do watch the video and um, get an understanding as the background of this regulation. All they've done is they've removed it from one scope into overall scope. Oh, this one. Um, all of 531's been rewritten. There are a few sections that are rewritten, to be honest. Uh, over voltage has been rewritten as well. Part 6 has been moved around. Um, so, you know, the, the actual way we do the work doesn't change much in a way of significance. But they have added here, under 531.3.2, a mention of unwanted tripping. And it says, so we have asked these, it shall be selected and erected so as to limit the risk of unwanted tripping, so discrimination, etc., etc. All that it says, in order to avoid unwanted tripping, the protective conductor current and earth leakage current that accumulate within this downstream circuit of the RCD should be no more than 30% of the rated residual current of the device. Um, 
what this means is if we were to install a 30 million pass CD, we need to verify that the overall protective conductor current and any leakage currents, although any leakage currents really are kind of full currents, but any protective conductor currents actually given within that circuit need to not exceed 9 milliamp overall. Um, this does mean we need some information. We will need some um, information about the equipment being put onto a circuit when we select a protective device. For intensive purpose with ring finals, etc., that's not really practicable. Um, so it might be that we choose to put in more RCD sockets instead of RCDs for circuits. It might just be that we kind of wing it and we see how it how that develops. But they're saying that we need to look at ensuring we do not exceed anywhere near half. Because if you go anywhere near 15 milliamp on a 30 milliamp RCD, it's going to potentially start tripping and that won't actually be a problem. It'll be oversensitive, but they can start tripping any time from half their ratings. We need to make sure we don't get near that. And that's why we do a 30%. 531.3.5.3 for TT Systems. They've actually um, redrafted the table that gives you the idea of the maximum value of resistance you know, to the exposed conductive parts of your earth, your, your earth resistance when um, selecting an RCD to protect a TT system. So uh, typically um, we're looking at uh, resistance to exposed parts, taking into account possible seasonal variations, so like electrodes and things like that. Um, and then you have a value of resistance, and then it will reflect on the overall maximum ideal, ideal terrain of the RCD. But again, just do remember this is just typically Ohm's law using a valuable touch voltage of 50 volts. That's all it is. But they put it into a bigger table for you. Um, should you should you want to use it? Uh, as I said, part six, not a lot. Uh, they've moved things around. They've uh, changed the chapter numbers. Um, not a lot there. We have a new special location, section 730, for um, inland navigation vessels. It's kind of like the marina section, but um, a little bit more timid. Um, they've got things like galvanic separation there, which is quite interesting. But again, it's one of those areas you'd revise if you were to approach this type of work. The uh, Within the appendices, we do have the minor work cert. That has had some additional content added to it so we now have to include the zdv supplying the final circuit which would require a zs measurement or a zdv measurement at the board that we are working on um, verification of the earthy conductor and bonding conductors an actual value of r1 plus r2 or r2 a numerical value instead of just ticking confirmation that it was there and if we are working on a ring final we want to actually now record values for the ring final continuity which is which is for all uh, intensive purposes uh, a good idea. More information, more accuracy. Within the schedule of inspections, they've added two components. One is making sure the uh, distribution board, the components are suitable according to the assembly manufacturer's instructions or literature. In other words, when you're going to install the, the panel, follow the instructions. Uh, particularly with, now we have these Amendment 3 boards in domestics. Make sure you're going to follow the, the uh, manufacturer's specific requirements with regards to uh, penetrating enclosure, applying any intermescent compounds, etc., etc. Follow the instructions um, and make sure you do that. We also have, um, as we've mentioned, the luminaires circuits with luminaires and domestics. We have that now as an inspection to consider for our schedule of inspections with circuits. Um, only applicable in domestic. And one of the biggest changes, obviously, is we were going to talk about a part eight for energy efficiency. That has been pulled out and been reintroduced as Appendix 17 in a much smaller scale. Um, it does provide recommendations for the design and erection of electrical installations. Uh, so it's not an instructive section. The idea is to consider it. Uh, for larger design pro pro uh, projects, this is um, one of those ethical things where they've got to obviously do a design make sure it's economically viable but then they need to consider energy efficiency and quite often if you're if, if you're leaning over to making sure it's economically viable you're coming far away from energy efficiency energy efficiency normally will result in more costs so you know more effective selection of equipment even things like uh, some of the requ the previous suggestions were things like installing larger cables you know you select a cable to make sure it can carry the current but actually go up a notch to to lower the thermal losses that was something that was mentioned in the suggested part eight, and so there are there are a number of things that we need to consider there. Um, 
again, this is something that probably won't tap into the domestic at all. This is something that will be largely in the commercial sector. There is a mention in the Appendix 17 that it is intended it will be developed into Part 8 later on. So we will see. Um, we know that we know that it was um, pulled out because uh, people basically challenged the fact that it wasn't within the object or fundamental principles of the regulations, uh, which I'll cover in a minute. But um, that's that's actually that's it. That's 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 the most uh, that is most of the new stuff. All right. So to conclude, there was mention of Foundation Earth electrodes in the previous um, draft of public comment. They that's been pulled out. Yeah, the old 542.1.201 did mention the installation of an earth electrode submitting any earthing facility. They pulled that out. So there's no foundation earth electrode now mentioned. As I've said before, RCDs on all sockets, they've pulled that back. They've introduced risk assessments again. So the need for RCDs on all sockets may not be there. And they've postponed part eight. Okay, because it's not within the object and fundamental principles of BS7601, meaning the object of the effects of the regs was to provide for safety and proper functioning for the intended use. And the fundamental principles was to provide for the safety of persons, livestock and property against dangers which may arise in the reasonable use of the system. Energy efficiency is part, isn't part of that isn't part of that scope, isn't part of that vision. And so the wine regulations, it, it was challenged that it's not in the interest of our wine regulations to incorporate the consideration of energy efficiency. But it's postponed. So they'll bring it sooner or later. Alright. Uh that's it in a nutshell. Um more information will come when each of these sections broken down. I'll be blowing up the regulations anyway, uh in a with a full course which I'll be offering anyway. So, you know, there'll be more and more and more information on this channel very, very soon. Um it's just a case of dotting I's crossing T's, making sure that what I do put out there is um is guaranteed uh pretty much got an understanding of what is going to come out uh, but you never know so work with us for now uh, but yeah uh, do research other areas as well if you want to or you know message me back and ask me about any specifics that you have um, I'll probably do another update on this in a week or so just to kind of make sure that we're still on the same uh, page with it but there we go that's it for now cheers bye bye